Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Felden, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, I always like to see that red light come on. And uh, we're glad that you've all had your coffee and we're ready to take off with a second program today. For those of you joining us on television, again, we just want to thank you from the depths of our heart for all your kind letters. My, I wish I could just share our letters with, with everybody. You know the favorite theme? I may be 30 years old, some are 40, 50, 60, 70, it doesn't matter how old they claim to be. For the first time in my life, I am understanding the Bible, and I'm enjoying it. Well, that thrills us, because uh, that's all we want to do, is just help folks to study on their own. Don't sit back and listen to what I say. Don't sit back and listen to what some preacher says. Get into the book, because this is where it's at. You know, I can... Twist things if I wanted to, and if people twist it, you know they do. But uh, the word is sure, it's steadfast, it's unchangeable, and so that's what we hope we're accomplishing. And again, we want to thank you for your prayer support, your financial help. After all, we do have to pay for TV time. I think some people think they pay us. You know, that's what my wife thought. You know, <laughs> when they called and asked if we would come and do this up here at Channel 47, <laughs> She thought, well, they pay all the comedians, <laughs> why don't they pay you? <laughs> but uh, that's not the way it works. We, we have to pay for our own TV time, and so we do appreciate so much your financial help. And as I've already said, your prayers. So anyway, we're going to keep right on going this afternoon. And I suppose if I want to title these four programs, Jerry, we can just title it as The Day of the Lord, this time of vexation, this time of devastation, death, destruction, the wrath of God, however you want to put it, it's coming. And uh, don't blame God. He gave the human race 6,000 years to give him credit where credit is due, but they will not. And so finally his wrath is going to be poured out. All right, so we're going to still basically use Joel as our jumping off, but since we ended the program the last half hour, finishing with the verses in Psalms chapter 2, I'm going to jump up now in this half hour to some of the other portions that deal with this same term, the day of the Lord. So for now, turn to Isaiah chapter 2, and uh, I'm going to start reading at verse 6, and the term we're going to head for is in verse 12. But let's start reading in verse 6. Now remember, this is Isaiah. He writes some uh, almost 100 years later than Joel. And uh, they are, of course, writing before the Babylonian captivity, which happened in about 606. But nevertheless, Isaiah also is going to use the same term. All right, chapter 2, verse 6. Therefore... Thou hast forsaken thy people, the house of Jacob, because they be replenished from the east, and are soothsayers like the Philistines. They please themselves in the children of strangers. Their land also is full of silver and gold, neither is there any end of their treasures. Their land is also full of horses, neither is there any end of their chariots. Their land also is full of idols. See, speaking of... In this case, the Babylonians, I think. They worship the work of their own hands, that which their own fingers have made. The mean man boweth down, and the great man humbleth himself. Therefore, forgive them not. Enter into the rock, hide thee in the dust, for fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty. Verse 11, the lofty looks of man shall be humbled, the haughtiness of men shall be bowed down. The Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. Now here it comes, verse 12. For the day of the Lord, the same day of the Lord that Joel talked about, that Psalms 2 was foretelling, now Isaiah speaks of it. For the day of the Lord of hosts shall be upon every one that is proud and lofty, <coughs> upon every one that is lifted up, and he shall be brought low. 
In other words, even the kings and presidents and senators and emperors and generals, they're all going to come under this tremendous wrath of God. All right, it's going to even affect the physical. Verse 13, And upon all the cedars of Lebanon that are high and lifted up, and all the oaks of Bashan, the eastern country beyond present-day Iraq, and upon all the high mountains, and upon all the hills that are lifted up, and every high tower, and upon every fence wall. In other words, this wrath of God is going to fall on everything and everybody. Now again, always go back to the analogy that we drew from the book of Joel. Grasshoppers, locusts, just destroying everything in their wake. The bark off the trees, the wood off the houses, the water out of the creeks and rivers, everything goes, see? Well, that's a symbolic picture of this horrendous day of the Lord. All right, now let's jump up a little ways further. Still in the Old Testament prophets, come up with me to Jeremiah chapter 25, and we've used these verses before. And this is a little more graphic, a little more frightening. In fact, if you aren't frightened at the situation in the world today, then you don't know what's going on. Because it is getting frightening. We as believers are going to be hated more and more. And we know that there are powers out there that think that we're doing their God a service by getting rid of us. And if the Lord doesn't come, we may face that yet earlier than we like. But here it is in the day of the Lord, Jeremiah chapter 25, and uh, oh, I'm going to just for sake of time now drop all the way down to verse 30. Now this is another description of the events associated with the day of the Lord. Verse 30, Jeremiah 25, Therefore prophesy thou against them all these words, and say unto them, The Lord. Now that's the term for Jehovah, which is the Old Testament term for God the Son, or Jesus the Christ, as we know him in the New. All right. And so the Lord shall roar. Now I just caught this since I've been preparing for this this last week. You know that whenever you have Scripture dealing with God's judgment on the Gentile world, I think you'll almost always see the word roar. Just look for it. Now, that's just a little tidbit again, that as you study on your own, just look for that term, the Lord will roar. Now, I don't think it's ever spoken of on Israel alone, but whenever the Gentile world comes in, this is the term, all right? The Lord shall roar from on high, utter his voice from his holy habitation. He shall mightily roar upon his habitation. He shall give a shout as they that tread the grapes. Now, if we got time this afternoon, we may see the references that are associated with the treading of grapes in the book of uh, Revelation and Isaiah. <clears throat> but he will shout as they that tread the grapes against all the inhabitants of the earth. Not just Israel. Even though Jeremiah is writing to Israel, yet watch the language this roaring is going to come upon the whole human race. Now, verse 31, watch the globalism of this language. A noise shall come even to the ends of the earth. For the Lord, God the Son again, has a controversy with the nations, plural. See, not just Israel, all of them. He will plead with all flesh. He will give them that are wicked to the sword, which, of course, is an instrument of death. Verse 32, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Behold, evil shall go forth from nation to nation. Not righteousness, not holiness, evil. And a great whirlwind shall be raised up from the coast. Now, the other word for coast is borders. Sometimes your marginal help will tell you that. 
And so these great whirlwinds are going to be established, will go from nation to nation, from one border to the other. And I feel that this is an indication of nuclear now, explosions, because I feel this is toward the end of the seven years. Now verse 33. And I think this nuclear devastation is going to almost go from one end of the planet to the other. There are enough nukes stored to destroy this whole planet ten times over. And uh, they're going to use them, but I don't think it'll be until we get to those last year or two of the tribulation. And here is the end result. Now verse 33. And the slain of the Lord. This is God's wrath. Not his love. It's his wrath. And the slain of the Lord shall be at that day from one end of the earth even to the other end. They shall not be lamented, nor gathered, nor buried, because there's going to be so many of them. There won't be any opportunity for anyone to even take bulldozers, because there'd be nobody to run the bulldozer. And they shall be as trash upon the ground. All right, that's a graphic description, of course. But that, too, is written by one of our Old Testament prophets. All right, now let's just jump up to Ezekiel. Ezekiel. Now, this is another big battle. And I almost stood alone for the longest time, not any more. There are a lot of people beginning to see it, as I have for a long time, that this battle will be in the first year, I feel, of the tribulation. Probably toward the end of the first year, maybe the 10th or 11th month of the first year of the seven. And it's the great northern invasion when Russia and the uh, Muslim world to the south of them, as well as North Africa, will come together under a Russian leadership and they're going to invade the mountains of Israel. And again, I guess maybe that takes a little explanation. We know that as soon as the Antichrist comes in, and we'll be looking at it down the road, but I think in order to understand this, we have to jump ahead of it. When the Antichrist makes his appearance, the first thing he's going to do is get a tremendous peace treaty established in the Middle East, which will be a supernatural thing because humans would never be able to do it. But supernaturally, in God's design, he will bring about a peace treaty between Israel and the Arab or the Muslim world. And we know from other scriptures that it's going to be a treaty that will allow Israel to rebuild their temple. They're going to go back into temple worship. And those of you who have been there, or if you've read about it, there's a group in Jerusalem that have everything ready for temple worship. They've got the priest's garments hanging on the mannequins, and they've got all the shovels for the altars, and uh, they've got everything ready. And so as soon as that temple is built, why, it'll be a matter of hours, and they'll reestablish temple worship. And so we have to realize that that peace is going to be a phenomenal thing that will actually bring the Arab world to permit Israel to build a temple. But they will. Okay, now then, with that kind of a peace and prosperity, just making the Jewish people in a state of euphoria, they're going to think that they've got nothing to worry about. I think they'll dismantle their military in six months. They're going to send those Israeli troops and the gals home, and they're going to forget war and military operations, and they're just going to be just, like I said, in a state of euphoria. But you see, what they don't realize is that some Russian generals up there in Moscow are planning a great invasion. And, of course, it's God designed. God says he's going to put hooks in their jaws. He's going to pull them down. And uh, it becomes a means of God's judgment. But nevertheless, it's going to happen. The Russians are going to put together a great army, including most of the Muslim world. But as I've pointed out before and in some of my seminars, the unique thing is there are two nations here that are just almost hard to believe that they're not listed. And that's present-day Iraq or Babylon and Egypt. Egypt isn't in here. And neither is Babylon or Iraq. So I have to feel that something is going to happen over there that will yet bring Iraq to the fore as a financial center of the final seven years. Okay, so come in with me now to Ezekiel 38, where again, this is all part of the day of the Lord. 
this is going to happen after the tribulation has begun. Ezekiel 38, and uh, I guess I might as well start at verse 1. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief inch of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him. Now, all Bible scholars are pretty well agreed that that's terminology that points at Moscow and Russia, and of course, they're due north of Jerusalem. All right, verse 3. And say, thus saith the Lord God. See, this is all God's design. Behold, I am against thee. In other words, it's going to be a God act of judgment against the nation of Russia. I am against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and I will turn thee back. I'll put hooks into thy jaws. Now, this is symbolism of God is going to literally cause them to bring about this invasion. And I will bring thee forth and all thine army, horses, horsemen, all them clothed, all sorts of armor. Now, you've got to remember, Ezekiel is writing back in antiquity, so he couldn't say trucks and tanks and helicopters, could he? But that's what it'll be. It'll be military hardware. And they'll come with a great company, all of them handling swords or weapons. Now, here are the nations that are listed. Persia, present-day Iran. Yes, Iran is going to meet its doom. I think in that first year of the seven. Ethiopia. Ethiopia down there in Africa, and it is almost 100% Muslim today. Libya. And you know Libya is Muslim, under Gaddafi. All of them with shield and helmet. Gomer, which of course is Eastern Europe, and uh, Yugoslavia, and Albania. Northern Greece, that's all part of what we would call Gomer, and it too is mostly Muslim. And all his bands. And then the house of Togerma, that's Turkey. And goodness sakes, anybody knows that Turkey is predominantly Muslim. My, when we were over there, there some time ago, that's all you see are the onion head mosques. And uh, a couple of the girls that guided us in two different occasions were Muslims, but in name only. They were secular, but they were Muslim. And uh, simply because their parents had raised them, but they said they never practiced it. But nevertheless, Turkey is Muslim. And so all these Muslim nations now will be brought together by a Russian military leadership, and he's going to bring them onto the mountains of Israel. Let's just go right on down. I guess I can't skip any verses. Or somebody will call and say, well, why did you skip verse 6? Yeah, yeah, they do. They'll call. Well, why did you verse, uh, skip verse 6? Well, as if I've done it for a reason. But uh, yeah, we're not going to skip. Verse 7. Be thou prepared, and prepare for thyself, thou and all thy company that are assembled unto thee, and be a guard unto them after many days. See? So we know that this is at the end of God's time for the human race. This is in the tribulation. After many days thou shalt be visited. God's going to move in. In the latter years thou shalt come into the land. Now watch this carefully because you know this is exactly what Israel is today. In the latter years thou shalt come into the land that is brought back from the sword and is gathered out of many people. Now stop a minute. Go back with me to Deuteronomy. Go back with me to Deuteronomy. Keep your hand in Ezekiel. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 1 and 2, because this is exactly the prophecies that fit. You know, I also tickled Dick the other day after our Oklahoma City seminar. I don't know how many people, as they left, said, Les, I've been listening to you for years, but today is the first time that all the dots connected. Did you hear something like that, Dick? Yeah. Over and over. And then someone else said, now it all fits. Well, we just got to keep plugging away, and hopefully this is what will happen. Now, here's a good example. Moses is writing clear back here in 1500 B.C. prophetically. All right, got it? Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 1. And it shall come to pass. It's going to happen. 
when all these things are come upon thee, the blessings and the curse which I have set before thee. Now remember who we're talking to, the nation of Israel, the Jew. And thou shalt call them to mind among all the nations. Now what does that mean? Every one of them. Every nation on the planet. Now, of course, at the time that Moses wrote, it was still rather limited. But for our day and time, when it's going to happen, it means 140-some distinct nations. And Jews are going to come out of every one of them. All right? You will come to mind among all the nations whether the Lord thy God hath driven thee. And then verse 2, what's going to happen? And thou shalt return unto the Lord thy God, and obey his voice. Now, in order for Israel to return to the Lord, where do they have to go back to? The homeland. And have they? Yes, they're there. Contrary to anything logical, they should have never made it. But they did, and they are. All right, now then, chapter 38 of Ezekiel. See how it all fits? Where does this land that's going to be invaded, where do the people of it come from? every nation on the planet. The Jews have come in from every direction. All right, Ezekiel 38, verse 8 again. After the many days thou shalt be visited, in the latter years thou shalt come into the land that is brought back from the sword and is gathered out of many people, that's the Jew, against the mountains of Israel. Now, that's a term that we like to use just about like the day of the Lord. The mountains of Israel. All those geographical high points that you're acquainted with throughout the Old Testament. Where are they geographically in today's map? They're in the West Bank. They're occupied predominantly by Palestinians. And so the mountains of Israel are going to be invaded for a twofold purpose to chastise Russia and the Muslim world, but also to open the mountains of Israel to be occupied by the people who have had it promised to them from time immemorial, the Jew. All right, reading on. And they're going to come against the mountains of Israel, which have been always waste, but is brought forth out of the nations, and they shall dwell safely, all of them. And that's where they are. They're in relative safety. They're in production. My, a couple of years ago, we happened to be in Israel at the very right time. Honey, you remember when all the almond trees were in bloom? Oh, they opened the windows of the bus, and for miles, the aroma of the blossoms of those almond trees were just floating through the blood. Oh, it's just unbelievable. Not just a little grove or two. It was miles. That's Israel today in such production. See? All right, read on. Verse 9, now when it just seems as though Israel has finally arrived, they've come back from every nation under heaven, they're prospering, their production is unbelievable, the Russian generals get an idea. And the God says, thou shalt ascend and come like a storm up to the nation of Israel and shall be like a cloud to cover the land, thou and all thy bands and many people with thee, but now verse 10, but thus saith the Lord God. It shall also come to pass that at the same time things come in thy mind, thou shalt think an evil thought, and thou shalt say, I will go up to the land of unwalled or undefended villages. Now remember what I said a moment ago. As soon as the peace treaty is signed, Israel will dismantle their military. So what have they got to defend themselves? Nothing. Nothing. They're defenseless. And so this Russian invasion will take advantage of that. All right, verse 12. They're going to come to take a spoil, to take a prey, to turn thy hand upon the desolate places that are now inhabited and upon the people that are gathered out of the nations, the Jew, who have gotten cattle and goods. That's Israel today. Now you've got to remember, I've referred to this over and over. As late as... 1944, the final years of World War II, I had a good friend who was stationed with the British Army. He was detached from the American Army and was assimilated with the British for whatever reason. And so he ended up serving in Palestine, ancient Israel. 
And you've heard me say it before. How did he describe it? Absolute desolation. He said, there's nothing there. Now, this was, you know, when we, after the war, we're talking about absolute desolation. He said, I wouldn't want to be caught dead there. Well, that's what the scripture says, see? It's been desolate, but now it's in full production. So we know that we're getting so close that all these things are being fulfilled. Well, anyway, for sake of time, we only got two minutes left. I got to bring you on over to the end of chapter 38. What's going to happen to this invading horde? Oh, God is going to supernaturally annihilate them on the mountains of Israel. All right, verse 19. Verse 19 of this same chapter. For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath I have spoken. Surely in that day when this great invasion comes on the mountains of Israel, there shall be a great shaking in the land of Israel, so that the fishes of the sea, the fowls of heaven, the beasts of the field, everything, men upon the face of the earth, shall shake at my presence, and the mountains shall be thrown down. See, now this is all the supernatural activity of the day of the Lord. That's why I came back here. Now verse 21. God says, I will call for a sword against him, this invading force from the north. Throughout all my mountains, saith the Lord God, and every man's sword shall be against his brother. What are they going to do? They're going to be killing each other. Now remember, it said everyone's going to have a weapon. And so they'll be using their weapons on each other. Now remember, has that happened before in Israel's history? Sure, the Syrians did it. And when the Jews got there, all the spoil was laying there for them to take because the Syrians had killed each other, not knowing what they're doing in their confusion. And so the same thing is going to happen here. All right? Then verse 22. Here comes the wrath of God at the very first year of the seven. And I will plead against him with pestilence and with blood, and I will rain upon him and upon his bands and upon the many people that are with him, and overflowing rain, great hailstones, fire, and brimstone. Now, a lot of people think that's the language of Armageddon, and it is, but this is not Armageddon. This is a separate battle early in the time of the tribulation. And in verse 23 in closing, Thus God says, I will magnify myself, sanctify myself. I'll be known in the eyes of many nations, and they shall know that I am the Lord. So this is all a part of that great seven-year period known in the Old Testament and in the New. We'll see that in our next half hour that we call the Day of the Lord. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552, or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Felding.